The Frimley Seventh Day Adventist Church presents a three weeks virtual evangelistic campaign with Pastor Isaac Appel from Ghana. Theme Power Beyond the Breaking Point. Date from the 31st of July to the 14th of August 2021. Make a date with us and you will be blessed with life transforming messages that will connect you to God. Topics to be discussed include Light in a Dark Tomb. In the name of Jesus, power for the last days, the prophecy of hope. If God is good, why COVID-19? Whose side are you? The rise of Earth's last kin. Beware of false love. Remember this, my love, the mark of kin, the two unavoidables, and the ultimate vaccines. So tell a friend to tell a friend to join us in this virtual evangelistic campaign from the 31st of July to the 14th of August, it will be live on Facebook, YouTube, and also on Zoom. God bless you. Hello, good evening, everyone. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes. Good evening, everyone. And um, I'll, I welcome you all to um, this evening's Vespers. I'm hoping you have had a blessed week so far. And um, thank you for taking time to join in, whether you are through Zoom or through WhatsApp. Um, I really welcome you and um, I'm praying that you will be blessed um, this evening. So um, in front of you is the lineup of the um, activities this evening. And uh, my name is Yanki. I will be coordinating uh, this session. We will have an opening prayer from Sister Beatrice, and she will also read a key text. Our devotion will be led by Brother Maliko, and uh, we will have um, a media team facilitating our uh, session this evening. So without uh, wasting time, I'll, lay, I'll ask the media team to play opening song, Almost uh, Persuaded. Then after the opening song, we'll have an opening prayer from Sister Beatrice, who will also read our key text. Um, yeah, welcome all. Sweet, turn 
Shall we pray? We pray. Our might and loving Father above in heaven, Lord, we come before the throne of mercy. We thank you, Lord, for allowing us to come together and call upon your name. Thank you, Lord, for forgiving of, of our sins, mighty Father. This moment in time, Lord, as your children are gathered on this platform, I'm asking for your mercies and your blessings to be upon each and every person. Even those, Lord, who have not joined us due to different reasons. May you, Lord, visit them in a special way. Some of them are not feeling well, Lord. You, the only great physician, touch them, Lord, with your healing hand. Not forgetting, Lord, your children in the four corners of the world who are not feeling well. Visit them, Lord. There's some blessings which will be pouring on your, on your children on the four corners of the world, Lord. Please, may you also remember us. Mighty Father, at this moment, at this moment in time, I present Michael before thee, who is going to break the word. May you please hide behind him, your cross. Let us see you through him. Let the word which is going to share be the word which is going to make us grow. The word which is going to make us come closer to your throne of mercy. Lord Jesus, we ask him, for your protection. May you come down and be with us. Visit each and every person in a special way. It's only you, Lord, whom we can cry to. How I ask that you be with each and every person. Lord, I present the campaign which is coming before thee, which is starting uh, this coming week weekend. Mighty Father, I'm asking that may you prepare our hearts. May you prepare each and every person so that we'll be looking forward. May you prepare each person so that we can go out there and invite others. So that Lord, when the word will be shared, the word will be shared with other people. We are in the end times, mighty Father. Be with each and every person. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The key text is coming from the book of Matthew 27, verse 24. And I'll read in your hearing. When Pilate saw that he could not prevail at all, but rather than a tumult was rising, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I'm innocent of the blood of this just person. You see to it. Amen. Amen. Amen.
Um, Brother Malco, thank you for allowing God to use you this evening. And um, um, I pray that um, God will use you as he pleases uh, to speak to us through you. And uh, it's also my prayer that we hear uh, God's voice through you this evening. So this is your time and um, I welcome you. Thank you very much. Um, can you hear me just fine? Erin, I'm hearing yeah, you. I can hear ah, you. Perfect. Thank you. Yes. Um, thank you for everyone that's chosen to, to join today. Um, when I was told to preach, I think it was three weeks back, I normally like to listen to sermons and for some reason, the memory verse that Imam read today came into my mind and I thought, let me look deeper into this. So I'm going to read the memory verse and also a few verses before to get the context of this. I think we all know this story um, of Pontius Pilate, but the title is called uh, A Complicit Rinse. A Complicit Rinse. And we're gonna go deeper into this to find out why I chose this title. So today's verses are coming from Matthew 27, verse 19 to 24. That's where it's all found. So again, that is Matthew 27, verse 19 to 24. I'll give you a few seconds to open your phones and search if you, if you want to. <laughs> um, so I'm gonna start from 19. So Matthew 27, verse 19, 24. Verse 19. When he was sat down on the judgment seat, his wife sent unto him, saying, Have thou nothing to do with that just man? For I have suffered many things this day in a dream because of him. But the chief priests and elders persuaded the multitude that they should ask Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The governor answered and said unto them, Whether of the twain will ye that I release unto you? They said, Barabbas. Pilate saith unto them, what shall I do then with Jesus, which is called Christ? They all said unto him, let him be crucified. And the governor said, why? What evil hath he done? But they cried out, the more saying, let him be crucified. Then verse 24, a memory verse. When Pilate saw, that he could prevail nothing, but that rather a tumult was made. He took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just man. See ye to it. there is a danger in growing up. And the danger that I have seen is that the older I get, the more I change. And the more I change, the more when I look back at verses that I read when I was younger, the more I see them in a new light. When I was younger and reading these Bible verses, the things that come into my mind now are completely different from when I was younger. I thought I knew this, this story about Pilate when I was younger. I'm like, yep, he's the one that sent Jesus down the cross. And that's as far as I even imagined to look. But when this was, just came into my mind, I'm like, look deeper. Last time I preached a sermon on Genesis 3, Six, Genesis 3, 
we're going to go into that a little bit later. This is kind of a combination and a continuation, but in much more in depth. So when I read the Bible, I like how it tells story. I'm so used to, you know, watching movies or YouTube or just there's so much that comes into my mind and our mind that when I read the Bible, it's kind of refreshing because it finds ways to hook me back into thinking deeper and deeply about myself and about my salvation and about my environment. It makes me reflect when I read it. And it makes me replay what is trying to be said to me. So when I read these verses, Matthew 27, um, verse 1924, in my mind, I'm like, we did again. What's going on? And for me, when I read this, this time, I got something different from it. I was stuck between two opinions. Should I focus on Barabbas or Pilate? There's a, another sermon all about Barabbas. But I think in this instance, looking at Pilate is where I want to move to because in Pilate, I see myself. Now, I know that sounds <laughs> very like you see yourself in Pilate, but again, that's the beauty of growing up. You get to see something different in the same old stories that we know. So my last sermon I preached in Genesis three about Adam and Eve, about the fall, the fruit. And we can see that in Genesis three, there is something that starts. So first of all, God made man to reflect God's image. And in, my, in, in man's pursuit to become more like God, he became less like God. That's Genesis three. And he made that choice, male and female, on two parts. And to this day, we all suffer those consequences. This is why when Jesus comes again, he will need to recreate us because all of the choices we have made since then have taken us down this very rocky path. So God will have to come back and recreate us just like he created again in Genesis because our decisions have moved us further away from God. From the clothes we choose to buy, from the places we choose to live, from the friends we choose to make, it all began at the tree. There is a temptation that I find in myself and everywhere to, like in verse, 20, in verse 24 of Matthew, to wash our hands and my hands. Somebody get me some water. Things are going hectic. You know what? I can't control it. It's not my fault. Get me some water. You know what? What could I have done? Hands up. There we move on. But something kept coming back to me. We all make choices. We either make a choice to make God happy or make Satan happy. There is no gray area. We cannot be like Eutychus on the window. Picking both sides or picking which side feels good. Because even if it feels good, you're still making either God happy or the devil happy. Simple as that. But I want us to go deeper into the story. In, in this story, we're looking at Pilate. That's the main person we're looking at today. We're going to unpack him, see who he is, and see what we can learn from how he dealt with Jesus and also him as a person. So Pilate is a middle-aged man between 40 and 60. And by 40, he should have reached the age of accountability. 
even back then. He should have good sense by 40. Let's just say 40, rough number. He should be able to take responsibility for every single choice he has ever made or will make. And he should be old enough to know better. That's who Pilate is. So Pilate, let's imagine him now. Now, Pilate wore a Roman garment, like a robe, with a, like a sachet over his, his right shoulder. And he had a pendant representing his position as um, a, a Roman uh, procurator. And Pilate was this man with a mind that was looking at the political jungle um, and understanding that around him were a lot of hungry lions or, 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 or like hungry people trying to, to take his position and to see what mistakes he'll make. So his eyes were everywhere. He had a high position and he was looking around to see, you know what? They want my job, but I want to keep my job. Pilate also hated Judea. He saw the Jews as noisy and nuisance. They were aggravating to deal with, but for him, this was just a stepping stone to become a friend of Caesar's, for him to get higher and higher. We have to understand that Pilate made these decisions and life is simply a, a composite, a collection of decisions made. I am Maliko. The, how would I describe me? Maliko is every decision he has made since he could make a decision. That's who he is. But decisions, whether they be good or bad, both have equal consequences. If you make a good choice, there is a consequence behind that. If you make a bad choice, there's a consequence behind that because it's good and evil. Whatever inch you gain in Christ, Satan will fight that inch. Pilate wanted to be the person in charge and he chose to join the elite. He chose to join the group of people that would help him get there. And he was in the perfect position at that moment in time. Pilate married into money. His wife was rich. He wanted and enjoyed the authority and the benefits of being, you know, procurator and even higher. His job was, I want to get to the top. I want the power. I've married into money. I've got the job, you know, um, I'm in the right positions. Yes, I'm in Judea. I don't really like it, but this is just, you know, experience for when I get to the real job. That is pilot. Hmm. So we have to understand here that in this position where we're now in verse 24, Pilate is confronted with a, a heavy burden based upon his position. The higher you go in jobs and positions, the more responsibility is put on your shoulders. And because he's looking at the, the jungle he's in, people want to take his job, people are checking to see if he's doing a good job, is he sees his friend really? He now begins to play this game of chess. That's what he's doing. So first, his job is, you know what? Let me see if these Jews can handle it themselves. And, the, and he asked the question to them, like, what's he done? Like, I don't, no, he's okay. I don't see why you're bringing Jesus to me. But they're like, we want him to be killed. They, they literally ignore him. Then secondly, he tries to send Jesus to Herod. And then thirdly, he 
he seeks based upon the verses he seeks to to release jesus because he knows he's innocent he seeks to release jesus by trying to find one of those laws that are kind of forgotten that no one really cares about and he's like okay you guys like he's innocent i can see he's innocent but you you have come to me and you have an agenda but if i can play into the rules that i i am in come on we've got barabbas we have jesus it's, they must by now you know at least understand what's going on and when that doesn't work he tries to speak to jesus himself he tries to speak to him but here you can see pilot looking like i know he's innocent but let me use the pieces i know so that even i'm um, even if i'm trying to help jesus per se or trying to find a way out of this situation i still want to maintain my job i still want to you know still be in a position of power so that even if they say yes or they say no i'm still procurator i'm still the friend of caesar so his main driving factor was to keep his job was to you know to move up even though he knew what was right in that moment one thing i have learned is that life will not let you escape in my last sermon i, I preached a verse what does it say i think it's how shall we escape if we fail to neglect such great salvation which was first given to your forefathers and so on and so forth and the answer was you can't escape unless you go through christ but the thing about life this earth where we are right now is you can't escape certain situations and this was pilot's situation he had to make a decision whether right or wrong he tried to play chess to you know find a way out of it but he couldn't he had to make a choice and he did so here is pilot he's standing in self righteousness he's standing in front of this unsatisfied mob all they want is death all he wants is like he's innocent i want to go home but the mob are like wait oh, come on are you not the friend of caesar what's going on and now he starts to play you know as if he's courageous because if he acts weak in this moment it will play against him for all the hard work he has done perceived well yeah perceivingly and then he calls for the water somebody bring a pan bring a bowl let me wash my hands in this you guys have an agenda i want to keep my job so you do what you got to do i'm going to you know do what i got to do but that's your choice because of his self justification he justified it in his head saying i can't win on this one if i say what's right i lose my job if i just you know wash my hands then it's okay maybe he thought he would feel better by washing his hands see sometimes i when i look at the story of pilate and the story of the death of of jesus not even just me i think all of us we normally gravitate towards two people that we mainly don't like too much and that is judas iscariot and pontius pilate because those two were the main people that kind of put the axe down judas betrayed jesus pilate get a death sentence so these two people the start and the end basically these two judas and pilate but it's funny how life seems to deal its own punishments out so when it comes to pilate i think pilate when it comes down to bringing it now down from the bible into my life into 2021 i think pilate represents the united kingdom where we are right now not even that us us in the uk us who are maybe born or raised here or grew up here or work here or moved here he represents something in us about us we do not want to pay the price of privilege see the greater the privilege the greater the price you have to pay 
and it seems that the higher you go in life, the more your faith is tested, the more your boundaries are tested. And there is a price to pay. And it's funny. I can tell you on my side that I found that the higher I went in terms of jobs and looking for jobs, the more my foot had to be down and the more people are willing to like test my boundaries to see, do you actually believe in this? And oftentimes, you know, when you're in the choice between surviving or honoring God, we find ourselves like Eutychus playing both sides of the fence. But I, th I think as well, we're living in between one verse. I know in Revelation, we're living between a few seals. But in this moment, we are living between Judges 21-25. Um, so that's Judges 21-25. And it reads, in those days, there was no king in Israel. Every man did what was right in his own eyes. And I'll be the first to say, this is true. We are living in that time. Ask, not even ask, just go outside. You will see it. Everybody does what they think is right in their own mind. Watch the news. Watch where we're going politically. Watch what's happening in the society. Go into a workplace. They advocate. Do whatever feels good. As long as you don't harm me or anybody else, if it feels good in your sight, do it. Judges 21, 25. That is 2021. That's how I define it right now. We have become like Pilate. Pilate did what was right in his own eyes. Putting God second. More and more, I am hearing especially in my, well, I think first I'll speak about in Christian circles, this phrase, in my opinion, I understand it. We all interpret the Bible differently. But I think those words, in my opinion, are some of the most dangerous words that a Christian can say. Because we need to forget our opinions recently personally for me i have been challenging my own opinions you know i remember in the bible it says like you know all your righteousnesses are like filthy rags if i was able to stack up in my mind everything that i would define as holy and right and i kept everything i would have kept nothing because it means nothing it's filthy rags which means that for me to be a disciple of God, I need to constantly be evaluating whether if something was an inherited tendency, was a cultivated tendency, or if, if the thing that I don't like, I really don't like. So for example, there are certain things that we all find okay and certain things that we cringe at and say, that's a problem. You know, we could, some of us will be like, okay, you know what? A little lie won't hurt if it's just for like a little problem. But adultery would never do that. We seem to draw a line <laughs> somewhere. And it's kind of like the word, in my opinion, or my viewpoint, is a dangerous one because we need to forget our opinion because we have to follow what God says. Simple as that. God is not concerned about if you're convenienced well, if you're inconvenienced per se by it, he's more looking at, are you obeying what I'm saying? We need to follow God in everything that he says. I, I think a little bit about judgment day, you know, to see God's reaction if someone comes up and says, listen, God, um, you know what? I should have been more patient but you know what? It goes back in my family, three generations. We were anger in the family. So I, I could have made it, but you know, I had, I couldn't like, uh, I, you know, oh, oh God, you know what? I really had to work for my family. Like, you know, they had to have a good education and, you know, maybe I had to sacrifice my faith and this and that. I wonder what God would say when we come with our excuses to justify 
why we had our own opinions, not God's opinions, why we chose ourselves, not him. Hmm. Every man did according to what was right in his own mind. You know what? We have an Ishmael mentality. The story of Ishmael, we all know about it. Abraham, God told, God, God told Abraham, listen, Abraham, I want you and Sarah to have a child. And then the Ishmael plan, which some of us follow, is, listen, God, I have decided to do my own thing, okay? I have created Ishmael. Lord, can you please come and bless my mess? Because I wasn't really, like, you said you blessed me, but now that I've, you know, helped you out a little bit, God, you are, you are patient, you're loving, bless my mess. Because in my mind, you didn't really say, you know, Sarah, you said you bless me, and I'm Abraham, and I can marry anyone. So it doesn't really matter, God, like, justifying it, kind of like how Pilate justified it. And that's the Ishmael mentality. I'm not talking about legitimate children. I'm talking about the mindset, that illegitimacy where some of us, you know, God says, do something. God says, worship me. God says, honor me. God says, follow me exactly how I want you to. And we tell him, I'll follow you, God. I'll do it my way. Now I've done it my way and it kind of seems Christian. Bless it. Bless it because I'm doing it kind of the right way. So bless my effort. That's the Ishmael mentality and philosophy. We need to remember the function of the church. The church is a hospital. We know that. But the church is to help us, to bring us closer. Well, hmm. the church is there to help bring man, me and you, back closer to God and not to bring God down to us. In Malachi, there's two verses that kind of bring this into conclusion per se. In Malachi 3, 6, um, God says, um, let me just read it actually, Malachi 3, 6, for I am the Lord, I do not change. Therefore, you are not consumed, O son of Jacob. So God is basically saying, listen, I'm God, I don't change. Then we go to the next chapter, Malachi 4, 6. And it says something that kind of, when I first read it, it made sense. And to this day, I'm kind of like, <sighs> something, it, it would require you, God, for this to happen. But you said it could happen and it needs to happen. So let it happen. Malachi 4, 6 to me is something that I would love to see happen. And it says, Malachi 4, 6. And he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. What does this verse mean? The hearts of the fathers will be turned to their sons and their sons to their fathers. It basically means that, first of all, God does not change and they will not argue and they will not fight or fuss about what the Bible says. They will have the same heart and they will follow God and worship together. They will not be, well, you know what, in the last generation, you guys did A, B, C, and D, but now times have changed. So you should change how you worship God. The same God that was there for your parents was there for your grandparents, great-grandparents. So God here is saying, there will come a time where children and parents and grandparents will be on the same page. They will not be like when I was young, I did this or things have changed. It's God does not change. And we'll all have the same mindset. We'll all worship when, when that happens. Oh, goodness. <laughs> I can't wait for that. <laughs> I really can't. Now let's bring it back to Pilate. Let's bring it back to Pilate. So when Pilate said, verse 24, I find no fault in him. It meant two things. It meant he found no fault in Jesus, of course, but Jesus was more than just man. 
but also he found no fault in himself. That's why he got the ball to wash his hands. He was basically saying, I find no fault in him and I'm going to wash myself because I find no fault in my decision-making process. I won't lie to you. I found myself in that predicament where I feel like I'm telling God, God, the choices I have made, I find no fault in them because by the things I knew at that moment, I made the right choices. So I find no fault in me. God, pass me the ball. Let me wash my hands. How many times have you said that to God? God, I did what I, what, I, what I knew was best in that moment. So pass me the ball. I know there are consequences, but you know what, God? Um, yeah, I, what, what could I have done? I don't know what I could have done. All I had, blah, blah, blah. We need to be careful. We live in a world where even, for example, for divorce, we have no fault divorce for any reason you feel like it. But there is no such thing as a, a, a no fault religion. You know, there is either, you, you either obey God or you don't. If something happens, do you blame God? Our sin has separated us from God. We need to come back to God. The Bible says in Isaiah 1 verse 18, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Someone pass me the pan. Let me wash my hands. You cannot make it simply by washing your hands when things go hectic. Looking back at my life, how many times have I, how have you simply washed your hands saying, what could I have done? My hands were tied. Move on. But we need to look back and say, you know what, God, I, I should have come to you sooner. I should have worshipped you more. God, help me come into my life because it's only when we trust in him that he can clean us up and make us whiter than snow. I keep hearing when it comes to now, it's now personal, my age, age demographic, the young adults, certain things that when I hear it, I've heard it when I was in university a lot and still I'm still hearing it, concerns me in terms of our thought process. God does not care how I look on the outside, where I go, what I do what I put on, what I put off, what I drink. He doesn't care because he says, come as you are. So I'm coming as I am. So I'm going to keep the, I'm going to do whatever I want because God says, come as you are. So he doesn't really care about all these things. So I'm going to, you know, forget about all these verses about what God is saying. I'm going to focus on the verse that says, come as you are. That for me worries me as a young adult because I, I see it more and more. And it's something that has to be not addressed, but something that has to be brought into the light. A lot of the young people that we see are in a stage of their lives where they are fighting with their belief systems. And it's kind of like we've we have now modernized God by humanizing him. We have now been like, well, I don't feel like it's hurting anybody. So why would God care? Or they would say, uh, you know what? Yes, I know it's wrong, but I can pray later and me and God will be okay. So I'm going to still go to that club. I'm still going to take that drink because I know on Saturday I'll be, it's fine. It's okay. I'll come back. Malachi. Malachi says, I am God, I change not. We need to understand that we cannot modernize God. We cannot bring him down. The purpose of the church and the church community is to help each other to come together to bring us up to God, not to bring God down to us, to our level. Second Timothy 4.2 says, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season. 
convince, rebuke, exalt with all long suffering and teaching. What does this mean? It means firmly FDA church. Or the Mugadza, the shepherd. We need to preach the word when it's popular and when it's unpopular. This basically means whatever is happening, doesn't matter if, if it goes with what we believe or what we don't, we have to still preach the word. Even when it's, people don't want to hear it, we have to find a way. Think about it. Think about it. When you find a great deal on a car, you will preach. You will go and preach to all your friends about, listen, I went shopping. I found this car at a really good price. I was surprised. The mileage was great. Or you go, you know, to buy a dress and you're like, wow, this was a designer, but for some reason it was on discount. We preach about linen and metal. But when it comes to God, it's kind of like oh, it's religion. You know, I might lose my job or religion, you know, uh, that's for Sabbath. And it's like maybe even trying to integrate it into our conversations could be a start. We need to preach the word when it's comfortable, when it's not. Find a way. That's our job. Hmm. More and more people are saying, give me the pan. I want the water. Give me the water. That's why I keep saying we're kind of like pilot hmm. you know what I, I honestly believe that as long as we listen to what god is saying we can make it we are like pilot we make decisions that don't involve god and when the time comes It's a problem. Because we make decisions like pilot, we will, in we will inevitably have a time like pilot where we might have a good chunk of time where we do things our way, but then you'll be put in a position where you have to pick. Listen, pilot, you can't escape this. You're now in this position by choice. Pick God or pick your job. Uh, you're not a friend of your boss at work. Are you not an employee of this company? What will you pick? Would you pick God or a friend of Caesar? You choose. You cannot escape it. Hmm. Most of us have the right mindset. We will give up our jobs. We will give up, our, we'll give up everything for God. I know in our church especially, we love God. We, we want to do whatever it takes to, to honor him. But we find ourselves just like the rich young ruler. There is one thing that we lack. I don't know what that one thing is for you. You do. There is one thing that we lack. Should I go against my boss and maybe lose my job and my kids won't eat? So I, maybe, you know what, in this instance, I know it's Sabbath, but I'm going to go to work a little bit early. I'm going to just do it just this one so that next month I know I can still provide for my children. Or should I obey God and lose my job and whatever happens, go to take care of me? Or maybe it's, you know what, um, I, I'm looking for a career to go into and some of these careers, you know, um, they're asking me to, to do certain things that go against my belief system, maybe serve alcohol, maybe, you know, be selling tobacco, maybe doing certain things, maybe traveling to certain places I don't want to travel to, maybe be working in this location. But you know what? It's only short term. I, I, God understands. I will return his tithe. So he benefits too. Humanizing God. Let's look at, just to end this, what happened to Pilate? So 13 years after the death of Jesus Christ, when he sentenced him, he committed suicide in his bedroom. Pilate could not escape. In that moment, he was thinking, I have married a rich woman. I'm a friend of Caesar's. I'm washing my hand. Let me get back to work. 
this guy's innocent, but if he has to die for me to get my promotion, hey, uh, so be it. If only he knew the price. Do we know the price, church? What is it worth for you to, to the verse say, gain the whole world and lose your soul? I wonder if, if Pilate could go back 13 years before if he would have stood up for Christ. Because let's look back at this. Even if he said, you know, Jesus won't be killed, they would have still killed him. So it wasn't really about him. But because his mind was focused on progression, position, family, the Bible says, he who loves mother and father more than me is not worthy of me. I'm going to extend this. If you love anything or anyone, including your own spouse or family, more than God, will not be worthy of me. You cannot say, God, I had to do this, my family, and put you second. We need to put God where he belongs to be. Hmm. Today, you have a choice. Perhaps you're in the middle of Pilate's decision. Should I continue where I'm going and become the friend of Caesar? Or should I say, you know what? This man is innocent. I know Jesus is innocent and he died for me on the cross and I'm going to choose him. Come what may, whatever the cost. Thank you. Amen. Thank you. Thank you very much, Brother um, Marco, for, for that message. I'm hoping we are going to uh, go to our bed reflecting our relationship with God in our Christian's life for, for, for the, for the um, betterness of it. So um, to close up, we'll hear our closing song. Then I'll come back for the announcement. Thank you. Shall lead me night and day. Jesus shall lead me all the way. He is the true best friend to me. For I remember Calvary. Oh, I delight in his command. Love to be. Shall lead me night and day. Jesus shall lead me all the way. He is a true friend to me. For I remember Calvary. Onward I go. shall lead me night and day. Jesus shall lead me all the way. He is a true best friend to me. For I remember
we will have benediction from you, Malcolm. Um, thank you. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, out of all the creation you have created on earth, you have given us the ability to decide. Help us to decide to choose you. Help us to not wash our hands anymore. Help us to look at you and say, you know what, Lord, we choose you. Come what may choose you. Even if by choosing you is everything earthly, for you it's worth it. Help us to keep our eyes on the cross, for it's only at the cross that we could be saved. Forgive us of our sins, Lord, and help us to reevaluate everything. You are worth it for your glory. In just name we pray. Amen. Amen. And that marks the end of um, this evening's uh, Vespa session. We will now have announcements. So uh, coming up, uh, programs is as uh, presented in front of you. We'll meet again on Friday for our Vespers prayer service, eight o'clock as usual. Then uh, following that, we'll meet the uh, following day for our uh, Sabbath program as usual, starting with children's services, 9 a.m. Then Sabbath school service, half past 10 followed by preaching services, which is going to be at half past 11. Then there will be children's activities at three o'clock and we will have Vespa service at 5 p.m. And uh, we are going to start, we all know we are going to start our evangelism campaign from the 1st of August. So we'll have um, our program at eight o'clock on the 1st of August, 4th of August and 6th of August, same time, eight o'clock p.m. Uh, the the Freeman Seventh-day Adventist Church presents a three weeks virtual evangelistic campaign with Pastor Isaac Appel from Ghana. Theme, Power Beyond the Breaking Point. Date, from the 31st of July to the 14th of August, 2021. Make a date with us and you will be blessed with life-transforming messages that will connect you to God. Topics to be discussed include Light in a Dark Tomb, In the Name of Jesus, Power for the Last Days, The Prophecy of Hope, if God is good, why COVID-19? Whose side are you? The rise of Earth's last kin. Beware of false love. Remember this, my love. The mark of kin. The two unavoidables and the ultimate vaccines. So tell a friend to tell a friend to join us in this virtual evangelistic campaign. From the 31st of July to the 14th of August, it will be live on Facebook YouTube and also on Zoom. God bless you. Uh, looking ahead, the programs are as um, projected in front of you. I'm not going to read all of them, but please take a time and read and um, make an effort to do what is needful. And uh, that marks the end of tonight's session. So I just wanna wish you all good night.